Sir, thank you so much for a few minutes. Really appreciate it. As promised, I wanted to uh, start with a layup. You are very fresh off of a Grammy win. The album is Divine Tides. This is your seventh Grammy. It won for Immersive Audio Album. My camera just going to do that, by the way, sometimes, and we're going to roll with it. Uh, sure. Why don't you talk to me uh, about that project <laughs> and uh, what it is and what it's about? Well, it's the second Grammy in two years for the same album, basically. Um, and uh, it's a musician called Ricky Cage uh, out of Bangalore, India, who is a tree hugger par excellence, an ambassador for peace and such. And um, he was concocting this album and he sent it to me to bang stuff on it and to just kind of like just put some input into it. And as soon as this tape started arriving here, I started miking up all my cool stuff and banging a lot of stuff. And um, and we ended up making this record together. Mostly, I have to say, mostly him with me just directing or, or complaining or, or uh, you know, exhorting and encouraging. Uh, and it, he's a heck of a musician, that guy. And uh, we got a, a Grammy last year. Um, and then again this year for the immersive mix of the same album. And that's basically just like a surround sound kind of mix as opposed to a stereo two yeah. track. Got yeah, it. I think for all seven of the people in the world who actually have such a system. <laughs> it's important to those seven people. It got it got Yeah, I love them. It I did. love them in their non-multitudes. Yes, uh, it did the job. So I just wanted to backtrack because you, you've such, and it's well documented, we don't have to do the whole blow by blow, but an, an incredible family history, dad in the CIA, mom an archaeologist, spent time in Cairo, then in England. And one thing that I, it, I just was thinking about when you're, you have all of those kind of experiences as a young person. I remember when uh, uh, James Lipton asked, uh, this will come around, I promise, Steven Spielberg about the scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And it was about uh, a musician and a scientist working to together to communicate. And those were basically stand-ins for his parents. And I would have to think that for someone who has parents from such diverse backgrounds and you spending so much time in different cities, I'm sure that prepared you quite well for being a member in a power in a, in a power trio. That true? Would you say all those experiences kind of prepared you for navigating yeah. in a band? Well, actually, no. The experience that, you know, the, the experience was roadieing for all of my big brother Miles's bands. He was a big rock mogul and I was a roadie for Wishbone Ash and Renaissance and Curved Air. And I tour man and then I rose up and became a tour manager. I tour managed uh, Joan Armour Trading's first tour of America. So all of the nuts and bolts of how bands work, uh, I, I got to learn all that, how to load a truck, how to collect the check, how to manage the uh, lead singer. And um, those are all very useful skills. But the music part, the art part, came from before that, growing up in the Middle East, surrounded by Arabic music. And that got into my DNA uh, as just a, it's kind of a secret sauce, I guess, which infused Police's music with those involuntary input of uh, Arabic culture. Mm -hmm. And a, uh, an interesting anomaly, or, or just a kind of a quirk of, of fate, is that uh, reggae shares some fundamental rhythmic building blocks with Arabic music. Uh, traditional Arabic music with its landing heavy on the beat three of the bar and a gasp of nothingness for beat one of the bar uh, shares that with reggae. So when the police started playing reggae-ish music, I already had that kind of loppy, loopy, back to front, bass backwards kind of rhythm it was already a real natural fit. Uh, I have to also ask about one of your drumming influences. I read someplace that one part of your thought process was to hear something and think about uh, the way that Mitch Mitchell would play it. And uh, what about his playing inspired you so that you wanted to externalize some of your playing and kind of get inside uh, his thought process? Well, it was pop music with raging drums, with chops all over the place. You could have, you know, top 20 hits with drums all over the place, which was true of Cream as well. And those, you know, he was like a jazz drummer playing with Jimi Hendrix. And my problem as a youth, as an adolescent, uh, my schizophrenia was I, my fantasies, who am I? Am I the guitarist or the drummer? Because you can't do both at the same time until years later with Clark Kent, 
where in a studio, you can do all the parts, yeah. uh, just not on stage. <laughs> I actually did want to ask about that because that's a really interesting approach uh, to the drum kit. And I do a, uh, audio work outside of uh, my day job here. And so I was revisiting uh, ahead of this interview, uh, the Zenyatta Mandata album. And I couldn't help but think to myself, the way that that is mixed, the drums are so forward and a lot of the way, <laughs> a lot of it, yeah, I was going to say, the, uh, to quote the great Charles Barkley, I know I'm uh, mixing references here, but it's the engine that stirs the drink. It's such a drum forward, it's such a drum That's forward. That's a heck of a mixed album. metaphor, by the way. I got to credit Chuck. I can't, I can't yeah. say I came up with it. But I, to me, that was so. That seemed like it was such an archetype of your style of drumming. It's really involved in a way. It's sort of you know the lead of the group. Earlier, you talked about how working as a roadie, you uh, learned to uh, manage working with a lead singer. But uh, how did you find kind of your voice in this sort of you know drum forward style that the that the police had? We as musicians had an instinctive bond. We shouted and complained and tried to shoot each other down, stab, stab each other in the back and the front, anywhere where we could find a chink in the armor. Uh, but we had a musical bond. And that bond existed before we even had any decent songs to play. You know, Sting and I starred for a year and a half before Andy joined up with these two fake punks and no Roxanne. I mean, Sting hadn't started writing songs yet when Andy joined. And yet he saw something in the two of us that we saw in each other and we starved together uh, playing punk as a punk band, playing my songs, which were basically crap bass lines with yelling. Uh, and <laughs> that held us together. And even when we were at each other's throats, uh, looking for places to throw the javelin, we were on the same page, weirdly. Uh, I wanted it louder and faster. Sting wanted it quieter and slower so you could hear his beautiful lyrics. I would never listen to his beautiful lyrics. I was banging stuff, you know? And, uh, and it wasn't until years later, in fact, a couple of years ago, that I actually got quite familiar with those lyrics and developed a new understanding. Doing these derangements for uh, these orchestral shows, I had to go up to my nose in those songs, including the lyrics. Oh my goodness. So that's what he was singing about all this time. <laughs> we'll come back to those derangements in just a second, but I'd have to, how did you get involved? Because you do so much of this work in opera, in ballet, uh, being of the generation that I am, Spyro the video game is a great one, but you do so yeah, many one of these... my most proud achievements. Okay, well, talk to me about it. Talk to me about working on Spyro, this iconic video game. Well, it uh, well, there was a lot of it. And the volume of material that I had to produce for it taught me something. Um, it's strange how you learn more as a hired gun than you do as an artist. As an artist, you just follow your instincts and do whatever. As a hired gun, you go where the boss man points you and therefore learn stuff. And in Spyro, I had to come up with like a quadruple album of backing tracks every summer for four years and just churn and burn. Okay, here's, a, let's see, uh, I'd do four a day, actually four over two days. I'd write four tunes. Da, 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 da. Okay, that's one. Okay, dun, 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 dun. okay, that's another one. And then I'd get four things. And then the next day I'd develop in a little further. Bang, that's four down. Okay, I need four more. In fact, no, I need 50 more. And so I, I've forgotten the number now, but there's like four or 500 tracks. And uh, I am susceptible to them. I really like them. And I had the, the simplest synthesizer samples. I had to work so fast, I couldn't get into any finesse. And I think the lesson from that for all musicians, all artists, is that when you haven't got time to think, when you haven't got time to judge, to say no, to rethink, you just charge forward. That's when you get into the, you delve into the real good stuff way down deep in the mind. And you only get that when you're in too much of a hurry to ruin it and so that's why i really value that spyro stuff and when i write my big symphonies and operas and whatever the fancy the fancy stuff uh i go back to spyro for those little three note tricks that that bass line that's just that came up out of nowhere in my sleep uh in exhaustion and i go back there for the cool stuff i was just about to say because that made me think about because you do so much commissioned work you do so many other things is 
Is that why you keep going back to these, you know, you talked about like the, the high class acts or however, or however you put it, as well as the, you know, music for media. Is that why you keep going back to them? You're just, you love the challenge and you love being in that kind of working environment? Well, I don't partake of the music industry so much anymore. Hmm. I work with classy acts like the Rochester Philharmonic. Uh, and uh, it, the ice, it, it's just a much, it's a more rarefied world, I guess, but it's not a rat race. Uh, hmm. I am the wrong, I am 70 years old uh, and getting grumpier by the minute. Um, I got no place in pop music. I mean, that's not for me. I'm not supposed to be there. So I'm here. I'm very happy that I'm still earning Grammys at 70 years old uh, and can still run laps around my sons who are just hitting their 40s. Uh, so I don't score films anymore. I do opera instead. The pay is lousy. You cannot feed a family on opera, but it's artistically and creatively beautiful. Uh, I don't have the studios, Warner Brothers or Disney or anybody breathing down my neck and breathing down the director's neck. You know, I love working with directors. I love working with story, but man, the business is, they run so scared that it's just no fun. Uh, and I'm very thankful for all I learned under the gun. Uh, I never would have, you know, it was, it was my first boss, Francis Coppola, who said, I need strings. Uh, so I had to go higher and higher strings and thereby learning how cool strings are. And then over the next 20 years as a hired gun professional, uh, learned how to write for strings, how to, or how to arrange for the orchestra. And I developed a deep bond for my cousin musicians that I lovingly refer to as the orcs. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the orcs. You've got this fantastic show coming up in Rochester. It's a collaboration between the RPO and the Eastman Philharmonia. And of course yourself, these are called uh, derangements. I'll just leave the floor open to you. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about the show, putting it together and what the audience can expect. Well, you heard about the part about what this drummer, punk rock drummer, no less, is doing uh, with classy actual musicians like the Rochester Phil. Um, but the derangements part came about as a result of a film that I made that derived from the Super 8 footage that I shot back in the day. At a certain point, I got a movie camera and had it stuck to my face for the whole police ride uh, from, you know, started back when we were checking into motels and playing clubs all the way through the stadiums. And I had, I had it all on camera, but of course, super eight footage, you put in a, you can't watch it because it's scratch it. Every time you look at it, you can't edit it. It just is. Then they invented computers. Uh, and uh, so I was able to digitize all this, this material and edited it all day. And I made basically the home movie from hell out of all that stuff. And my buddy, Les Claypool, uh, you know, I was telling me, I was telling him about it. He said, Hey, y'all send that off to Sundance. And so I did, I filled out the form, but it cost $35 to apply to Sundance, a uh, good investment as it happened. And they said, they called up and I was in the festival. They invited me to show the film at the festival. And damn, I guess I got to finish it. So I made a movie has to be police music, right? About the police. But it's got to be film music, which means it takes the left here and stops there and then picks up here. And so I had to cut it up uh, to make it suit the film. As my 20 years as a film composer, no music is sacred. It serves the picture, uh, especially when I'm the director. Uh, uh, so cutting that music up, I discovered all these police stuff. I went to the multi-tracks, live improvisations, found lost vocal ideas, guitar solos, really cool stuff buried there in the vault. And so I got these ideas and used them for scoring the film. Then you throw in the orchestra bit. And, I, and I, I've been playing orchestra shows forever. Uh, and so, you know, I did a few obscure police songs that I wrote. Uh, and they just went over so well that I was finally persuaded by management. Dude, play the hits. And, and I'm thinking, who am I to question such sound advice? Because uh, artistically, I mean, that's what that's for the business folks, sound advice, but artistically, those hits have much more emotional impact than all of the cool operas that I've written uh, because people had their hearts broken. They lived their lives, whether they were even police fans or not, that was the soundtrack, it, it has emotional impact. When you play Roxanne 
message in a bottle, every breath you take, it has an emotional impact that no new song will ever have. And so I've done it, I don't know, 20, 25 times now. I've been playing all around you know, Europe and America with the show and it always burns down the house. It is guaranteed and it has, I hope that I can see that it has a combination of, 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 of mystery of what, hide the hit, what song is he playing now? And then bang, you come in with a big chorus and everybody's happy. It really has, a, it, it moves me emotionally to be on stage. I get choked up seeing the effect that these songs have on people. That is a beautiful thing. We have a couple minutes left. I like to end all of my interviews with creative people on three kind of uh, big picture questions. You up for it? No, I well, sure. Cool. I only have a small brain, but I'll try and answer big picture. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of the boat we're all in, in local media. We just do our best to answer the big picture questions. Uh, we touched on some of these themes already, but I just love to uh, ask these again. Obviously, you've had a couple places that could qualify as your hometown. We talked about the influence of, you know, Middle Eastern music. But, you know, if you had to sort of put, you know, one one unusual thing or one specific thing about how your uh, hometown affected you as a musician and as a person, what would that be? Uh Beirut is where I got, you know, Beirut, Lebanon is where I got my secret sauce. But London is where I made it happen. You know, not just me. Jimi Hendrix had to go to London to, to find his mojo. And I guess it worked that way for me, too. So Beirut and London would be my hometowns. Excellent. Uh, let's talk about your next achievement besides getting this, uh, besides crushing the show with the RPO and Eastman. You do so much opera writing, playing orchestral shows. But if you had to pick the next feather in your cap, that you want in there, what would that be? Oh no, I'm, you're gonna lose all your listeners. My next trip is ballet. <laughs> I know, I know, I've been living with opera for all these years. So what are you doing now, Cousin? Oh, uh, opera, oh my, you know, he, we've lost him, he's gone. Uh, uh, there, you, know, I can, you know, opera, at least I can t explain to you that music and picture go together really well. And an opera company is a resource. They have a theater, they have an orchestra in the pit, they have these incredibly talented, skilled singers, and it's, I'll go there. Uh, if I don't like opera music, I'll make those people do music that I do like. And, uh, but now with ballet, it's a lot easier. And when you say ballet, I'm not so much thinking of pirouettes and people in tutus. I'm thinking of those cool dance moves I see on Instagram. Uh, you know, these Chinese high school class that, or Korean, where they just figure out this incredible choreography. And I like that stuff. I'd like to write music for that. <clears throat> now to get the Rochester Phil and orchestras of that caliber to play that ballet, I'm gonna have to call it ballet, even though uh, modern dance might be a more accurate description, um, but, in the same way that the opera company is where that talent and those resources reside, ballet, unfortunate word, uh, is where those cool dance moves. I mean, they're, they, you know, the, the, the modern ballet dancers can do, do that cool stuff. Last one, do you have any advice for aspiring drummers or composers? Uh, broaden your musical input. Listen, 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 listen. Drink it up and learn from everything but not just one thing, you know, you, you know, everything's so microcast these days, you find your radio station, it plays one kind of music. In fact, on uh, Sirius XM, some of the stations play one band. <laughs> I love Fish. Uh, I love Pearl Jam, but I mean, come on. I mean, I'm gonna have to turn away from that station. And I would say, listen to different ethnicities, different periods, classical music, Middle Eastern music, African music, South American, Brazilian, you know, broaden your input.